Hello everyone and welcome to the Growth Mindset Company channel. I'm Shravan Kumar, an MEP and contract expert, and today I'm joined by Gudam Saha, an advocate specializing in EPC contracts. Today we're diving into a crucial topic for anyone involved in engineering, procurement, and construction projects, how to pursue claims or manage changes in EPC contracts. This series is designed to help you navigate the complexities of EPC contracts with confidence. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to the team behind WisdomWaveShub.com. They have poured countless hours of hard work and dedication into creating comprehensive content that supports this series. For a deeper dive into the material we're covering today, head over to www.WisdomWaveShub.com. You can also find the link in the description below. In this video series, we'll walk you through the essential clauses, practical steps, and real-world examples needed to handle claims and changes in EPC contracts effectively. Whether you're a project manager, engineer, or legal professional, our goal is to provide you with valuable insights that are easy to understand and apply. We'll cover topics such as the concept of contractual change, the various types of changes like directed, constructive, and cardinal changes, and the detailed processes for managing claims and disputes. Each section will provide clear, actionable information to help you manage your projects more effectively. We understand that EPC contracts can be complex, and managing changes and claims can be daunting. That's why we've broken down these concepts into manageable parts, making them relatable and easy to grasp for a broad audience. So whether you're new to EPC contracts or looking to refine your expertise, stay tuned as we explore the intricacies of claim and change management in EPC contracts. Let's get started. Slide two, concept of contractual change. Welcome to the first part of our discussion on how to pursue claims or manage changes in EPC contracts. In this section, we'll explore the concept of contractual change. A contract change is necessary when the existing contract does not reflect what needs to be accomplished. Such changes may be due to unforeseen circumstances, conduct of the parties, or changes in buyer requirements, including funding limitations. Contract changes can be categorized as either bilateral or unilateral. A bilateral change is a contract modification signed by both the contractor and the engineer or employer's representative. These modifications are used to make negotiated equitable adjustments resulting from the change order. This process is covered under FIDIC Clause 13 and Clause 3.5. FIDIC Clause 13, Variations and Adjustments. This clause allows for changes to the work, adjustments to the contract price, and extensions of time. It includes procedures for the engineer to issue instructions, for the contractor to propose variations, and for valuing variations. FIDIC Clause 3.5, Determinations. This clause outlines the engineer's duty to consult with both parties to reach an agreement on any determination required under the contract. If an agreement cannot be reached, the engineer must make a fair determination based on the contract and all relevant circumstances. On the other hand, a unilateral change is one that the employer makes without the contractor's concurrence. FIDIC Clause 15, Termination by Employer. Unilateral changes are typically used for administrative changes, such as the termination of the contract by the employer for convenience or due to the contractor's default. This clause outlines the circumstances under which the employer can terminate the contract, including failure to proceed with due diligence, insolvency, or substantial breaches of contract. Additionally, the issuance of change notices is authorized and deemed necessary for the performance of the contract in terms of safety and quality. FIDIC Clause 13.1, Right to Vary. This specific subclause gives the engineer the authority to issue instructions for variations at any time before the completion of the works. It ensures that necessary adjustments can be made to enhance the project's success. Understanding these types of changes and their respective procedures is crucial for managing any adjustments needed throughout the project lifecycle. By following the guidelines set out in these FEDIC clauses, both parties can ensure that changes are managed effectively and fairly. Slide 3. Contractual Change Variation Continuing from our previous discussion, let's delve deeper into the types of contractual changes or variations in EPC contracts. Unilateral changes may be used to make administrative changes, while bilateral changes are modifications signed by both parties. Unilateral changes, as mentioned in FIDIC Clause 15 team, 
typically include administrative changes like the termination of the contract by the employer for convenience or for the default of the contractor. These changes do not require the contractor's agreement and can be implemented directly by the employer. This type of modification is also called a supplemental agreement. Bilateral modifications, covered under FIDIC Clause 13, involve negotiated, equitable adjustments to the contract resulting from a change order. Both the contractor and the engineer or employer's representative must sign these modifications. They ensure that both parties agree on the changes and any associated adjustments in price or time. They are also used to define letter contracts and reflect other agreements changing the terms of the contract. Equitable adjustments are the consideration for the contract change and include compensation or price adjustments to which the contractor is entitled upon the concurrence of a contract change. This is a crucial aspect as it ensures fairness and balance between the parties involved. Only the engineer or employer's representative has the authority to direct such changes, as referred to in FIDIC Clause 13 under Design and Build DMB, and other forms of contracts. Understanding these distinctions and the authority behind these changes helps manage project modifications efficiently, ensuring that all parties are aligned and the project progresses smoothly. Story of changes. Like commercial contracts, there are three main types of changes in EPC contracts. 1. Directed changes. 2. Constructive changes. 3. Cardinal changes. Directed changes must be within the ambit of the scope of the contract. These changes may involve design modifications resulting from drawings, specifications, employer's requirements, methods, and other contractual requirements. Directed changes are typically issued by the engineer or employer's representative under the authority granted by FIDIC Clause 13. These changes must be documented, and any adjustments to the contract price or timeline must be negotiated and agreed upon. Constructive changes occur when directives impact the cost or schedule of performance, effectively altering the contract terms. These changes result from implied or expressed instructions by the employer that are not formally recognized as change orders but have the same effect. Constructive changes might arise from the employer's actions or inactions, such as delays in providing access to the site or necessary information. In such scenarios, the contractor is entitled to equitable adjustments to address the additional costs or delays incurred. This ensures fairness and maintains the project's viability. Cardinal changes refer to significant modifications that are outside the original scope of the contract. These changes are so substantial that they essentially create a new contract. Cardinal changes can lead to major adjustments in the project's scope, cost, and schedule. It's important to handle these changes carefully, as they might require renegotiation of the contract terms or even the formation of a new agreement. Understanding these categories and how they are managed under FIDIC guidelines helps in effectively handling contract changes, ensuring that both the contractor and employer are protected and the project remains on track. 5. Claims and Disputes Cardinal changes are beyond the scope of the contract that parties agreed to and entered into. These changes are often termed as breaches of contract and may become the subject of disputes. Contract interpretation principles define a dispute as matters not mutually agreed upon by the parties in a contract. Whenever there are changes and the parties cannot agree on these changes, the disagreement results in claims or disputes. On the other hand, wherever there is a dispute, such disputes result in claims administration by the parties in the contract, as outlined in FIDIC Clause 20. FIDIC Clause 20, Claims, Disputes, and Arbitration. This clause provides a structured process for handling claims, disputes, and arbitration. It requires the contractor to notify the engineer of claims and keep detailed records. The engineer assesses claims and makes determinations. If disputes arise, the clause outlines steps for amicable settlement, adjudication, and arbitration. Differences on variations or changes with respect to claims occur when variation results from changes in scope, quantity, or either implied or expressed terms. Claims arise from matters in dispute or changes that are not quantified. These claims interrelate with disputes over monetary amounts, extensions of schedule, defect liability periods, or performance of the contract and its associated damages or considerations. 
relevant clauses to consider in the context of claims include FIDIC Clause 2.1, right of access to the site. This clause requires the employer to provide timely access to the site, failing which the contractor may claim for delays. FIDIC Clause 2.5, employer's claims. This clause outlines the procedure for the employer to make claims against the contractor, ensuring transparency and allowing the contractor to address or dispute the claims. FIDIC Clause 8, Commencement, Delays, and Suspension. This clause manages the start of work, handling delays and suspension of work, which are critical in the context of claims. FIDIC Clause 11, Defects Liability. This clause addresses the contractor's obligations to rectify defects during the defects notification period, which can be a source of claims if not managed properly. FIDIC Clause 20, Claims, Disputes, and Arbitration. This clause provides the overall framework for managing claims and resolving disputes through structured processes. Understanding and navigating these clauses are essential for effective claims and dispute management in EPC contracts, ensuring that all parties can resolve issues fairly and maintain project continuity. Slide 6. Claims and due disputes. In the context of EPC contracts, there are several remedies that may result after a dispute typically occurs. These remedies are designed to address the losses or damages suffered due to a breach or dispute. They include expectation damages. These damages aim to put the injured party in the position they would have been in if the contract had been performed as agreed. This includes lost profits and other benefits that the party expected to receive from the contract. Reliance damages. These damages compensate the injured party for the costs incurred in reliance on the contract. This includes expenses and investments made in preparation for or during the performance of the contract. Restitution. This remedy involves returning the injured party to the position they were in before the contract was formed. It may include the return of money or property exchanged under the contract. Stipulated damages. Also known as liquidated damages, these are predetermined amounts agreed upon in the contract that one party will pay to the other in the event of a breach. They provide a clear and enforceable means of compensation for specific breaches. Interest. This remedy involves the payment of interest on amounts due under the contract. It compensates the injured party for the time value of money lost due to delayed payments or other breaches. Punitive damages. These are rare in contract law and are intended to punish the breaching party for particularly egregious conduct. They are more common in tort law than in contract disputes. Specific enforcement. This remedy involves a court order requiring the breaching party to perform their obligations under the contract. It is typically used when monetary damages are inadequate to compensate for the breach, such as in cases involving unique or irreplaceable items. Understanding these remedies helps parties to anticipate potential outcomes of disputes and to negotiate settlements that reflect their interests and protect their rights. Slide 7 Claims Management Effective claims management is crucial for the successful administration of EPC contracts. Here are the key points to consider. Claims must be in writing. This ensures there is a clear and documented record of the claim, which can be referred to during negotiations or dispute resolution processes. Claims should be addressed in line with the provisions of the contract. Following the contract's specified procedures ensures that the claim is processed correctly and in a manner that both parties have agreed upon. Timely notice is essential. Providing prompt notice of a claim allows the other party to address the issue sooner, potentially resolving it before it escalates into a larger dispute. Substantiation of claims is necessary. This means providing adequate evidence and documentation to support the claim, making it easier to justify and validate the claim's merits. There must be a specific way of consideration or claims details. Clearly detailing the nature of the claim, the reasons behind it, and the desired outcome helps in the fair and transparent evaluation of the claim. Claims should be supported by certified evidence. Having evidence that is authenticated and verified adds credibility to the claim and strengthens the claimant's position. Finally, highlighting the contractual provisions clearly is important. By referencing the exact clauses and terms of the contract that support the claim, 
you can demonstrate how the claim aligns with the agreed contractual framework. These steps, when followed diligently, can help manage claims effectively, ensuring that they are resolved in a structured and fair manner, thereby maintaining the project's progress and integrity. Slide 8. Excusable Non-Excusable Claims Excusable delays, which result in a claims process, are a contractual provision designed to protect the contractor from sanctions for late performance. When delays are deemed excusable, the contractor is protected from default termination, liquidated damages, or excess costs of procurement or completion. Excusable delays lead to the recovery of additional compensation if the employer has issued notice for acceleration. These delays protect the contractor from penalties for issues beyond their control, including but not limited to Acts of God Natural events such as earthquakes, floods, or hurricanes that prevent the contractor from performing their obligations Acts of Government Actions taken by the government, either in a sovereign or contractual capacity, that impede contract performance This includes changes in laws, regulations, or governmental directives Force Majeure Clause, FIDIC Clause 19. This clause specifically addresses events that are beyond the control of either party, making it impossible to fulfill contractual obligations. It includes extraordinary events like war, civil commotion, strikes, and natural disasters. Unforeseen Circumstances, situations that neither party could have anticipated or controlled, such as unexpected site conditions or major supply chain disruptions. Non-excusable delays, on the other hand, are delays for which the contractor is responsible. These could be due to poor project management, lack of resources, or other factors within the contractor's control. Such delays typically do not provide grounds for claims or additional compensation and can lead to penalties or damages. Understanding the difference between excusable and non-excusable delays is crucial for managing claims effectively. Properly documenting and justifying excusable delays can protect the contractor from unfair penalties and ensure that the project continues smoothly despite unforeseen challenges. Slide 9. Excusable Non-Excusable Claims Non-excusable delays are those which are incurred by the contractor's default in the performance of the contract. These delays are not eligible for extensions of time EOT, and typically lead to liquidated damages or penalties. Here are some common examples of non-excusable delays. Ordinary delays and foreseeable delays by the contractor. These include delays that could have been anticipated and mitigated by the contractor through proper planning and management. Subcontractors' delays. Delays caused by subcontractors are considered the responsibility of the main contractor and are thus non-excusable. Contractors' failure to manage and perform obligations. This includes inadequate project management, failure to mobilize resources, and not adhering to the project schedule. Contractors' financial problems. Financial instability or insolvency of the contractor leading to delays in project execution. Contractors' failure in overall performance, resource, materials, P&M, EPC executions. Poor performance in executing the project scope, including procurement and construction activities. Concurrent delays. These occur when delays overlap with the contractor's activities, which are concurrent in nature or involve parallel activities. If the contractor is responsible for these delays, they are considered non-excusable. Non-excusable delays grant the employer specific rights, including employer's termination rights, FIDIC Clause 15, the employer can terminate the contract due to non-excusable delays caused by the contractor. This clause outlines the conditions under which the employer can terminate the contract, including failure to proceed with due diligence, insolvency, or substantial breaches of contract. Contractor termination, FIDIC Clause 16. This clause provides the contractor with rights to terminate the contract if the employer fails to fulfill their obligations, such as providing access to the site or making timely payments. Managing these delays effectively and understanding the contractual implications is critical for maintaining project progress and avoiding costly disputes. By adhering to the contract provisions and maintaining diligent project management practices, contractors can minimize the risk of, of non-excusable delays and associated penalties. Slide 10. Managing Excusable Non-Excusable Claims 
Proper management of both excusable and non-excusable claims is essential for maintaining project timelines and mitigating risks. Here are some key practices to ensure effective claims management. Proper logging to be maintained. Keeping detailed and accurate logs of all project activities, communications, and changes is crucial. This helps in tracking progress and identifying the causes of delays. Notice in writing for such delays. Providing timely written notice of any delays is essential. This ensures that all parties are aware of the issues and can take appropriate action. It also serves as a formal record in case of disputes. Schedule management. Regularly updating and managing the project schedule helps in identifying potential delays early. Proactive schedule management allows for adjustments to be made before delays impact the project significantly. Extensions of time, EOT, and claims. Understanding and utilizing the contract provisions for extensions of time and claims is crucial. Submitting EOT requests promptly and with proper documentation helps in justifying delays and securing necessary extensions. Mitigation and proactive measures. Taking proactive steps to mitigate delays is important. This includes adjusting workflows, reallocating resources, and implementing alternative strategies to keep the project on track. Substantiation and evidences. Providing adequate evidence and documentation to support claims is vital. This includes photographs, reports, correspondence, and any other relevant documents that can substantiate the claim. Records and data management. Efficient management of records and data is essential for tracking progress and supporting claims. This involves maintaining organized and accessible records of all project-related activities and communications. Claim Management Utilization Utilizing a structured claim management process ensures that claims are handled systematically and fairly. This includes following the contract provisions, keeping detailed records, and engaging in open communication with all parties involved. By adhering to these best practices, project teams can effectively manage claims, minimize disputes, and ensure that projects are completed successfully and on time. Slide 11. Flowchart for Contract Change Management In this slide, we have a detailed mind map outlining the flow of contract change management, often referred to as CCMS, Contract Change Management System. This visual representation helps in understanding the roles, processes, and documentation involved in managing changes effectively. Central component, delay, disruptive event. At the heart of this process is the identification of a delay or disruptive event. These events can stem from various sources, such as variations, design errors, abortive works, or any other relevant occurrences that impact the project. Compensation event. When such an event is identified, it is categorized as a compensation event. This triggers the need for documentation and action to manage the impact on the project. Project staff responsibilities. Project staff, including document controllers, site engineers, project managers, designers, and quantity surveyors, are responsible for recording the event. They document the specifics of the event on an event record ER sheet. Event record. The ER sheet captures critical information such as the ER reference number, date, project name, package reference, location, originator, cause of the event, and its classification as a critical or non-critical event. It also includes the cause, document references, effect, cost impact, time impact, and mitigation strategy. Role of the planning manager. The planning manager uses this information to update the project schedule, maintain a delay analysis table, and prepare a detailed delay analysis. This analysis integrates documents and records within project management software like Primavera. Role of the commercial claim manager. The commercial or claim manager takes charge of maintaining the CCMS, issuing contractual notifications, submitting interim particulars, and leading the claim process. This includes collaborating with legal support and HQ support as necessary. CCMS Server All ER sheets and related documents are uploaded to the CCMS server, which serves as a centralized data repository. This server can be local or cloud-based, ensuring accessibility and data integrity. Subfolders and Records Management The system categorizes claims into subfolders for organization and easy access. Each claim folder contains essential documents such as claim narratives, quantum and cost calculations, delay analysis, correspondence, and contemporary records. 
access point. All project team members and stakeholders can access this data through a designated access point, facilitating transparency and efficient management of contract changes. By following this structured process, project teams can manage contract changes systematically, ensuring that all necessary steps are taken to document, analyze, and mitigate the impact of delays and disruptive events. Slide 12, Dispute Resolution. Effective dispute resolution is a critical aspect of contract management in EPC projects. Various mechanisms can be employed to resolve disputes, ensuring that conflicts are managed efficiently and do not derail the project. These mechanisms include, but are not limited to, interest-based negotiation. This approach focuses on the underlying interests of the parties rather than their positions. By understanding each party's needs and concerns, mutually beneficial solutions can be found. Third-party involvement. Engaging a neutral third party to facilitate discussions and negotiations can help in resolving disputes impartially and fairly. Mediation. In mediation, a neutral mediator assists the parties in reaching a voluntary settlement. The mediator does not impose a decision, but helps facilitate communication and negotiation. Mini trial. A mini trial is a structured settlement process where each party presents a summarized version of their case before a panel, often consisting of senior management from both sides. The panel then seeks to negotiate a settlement. Dispute board. A dispute board is a panel of experts established at the start of the project to provide informal advice and formal dispute resolutions. This mechanism helps in addressing issues promptly before they escalate. Non-binding arbitration. In non-binding arbitration, an arbitrator hears both sides and makes a recommendation that the parties can choose to accept or reject. This can provide a preliminary view of the likely outcome in a binding arbitration or court. Ad hoc arbitration. This is a flexible form of arbitration where the parties select their arbitrators and establish the rules of the arbitration themselves without relying on an institution. Institutional arbitration. In this type of arbitration, a designated institution administers the arbitration process according to its established rules. Institutions like the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, or the American Arbitration Association, AAA, are commonly used. Litigation Lockadalat. Litigation involves taking the dispute to court for a judicial decision. Lockadalat, particularly in India, is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism where disputes are settled amicably outside the court system. These dispute resolution mechanisms offer various pathways to resolve conflicts, each with its own advantages and suitability depending on the nature of the dispute and the relationship between the parties. Understanding and utilizing these mechanisms can help in resolving disputes efficiently, maintaining project timelines, and preserving professional relationships. Transition to slaps up our deep dive into managing claims and changes in EPC contracts. We hope you found this series insightful and packed with practical information you can use on your projects. Remember, the key to successful contract management lies in understanding the clauses, staying proactive, and maintaining clear documentation. By following the steps we've outlined, you'll be well equipped to handle any challenges that come your way. Don't forget to check out www.wisdomwaveshub.com for more in-depth content and resources. The team has worked tirelessly to bring you the most comprehensive information available, and it's all there to help you succeed. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the Growth Mindset Company channel, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update. We have more exciting content on the way that you won't want to miss. Thank you for joining us today, and until next time, keep pushing the boundaries, keep learning, and keep growing. See you in the next video.